Chancellor Taylor, may I now present to this convocation the candidate for the Doctor Honoris Causa to be conferred by York University, Ruth Lore Malloy. <laughs> Chancellor, Vice President, members of faculty, graduates, and esteemed guests, I now present to this convocation the candidate for Doctor uh, honoris causa to be conferred by York University. Human rights activist, journalist, photographer, and writer, Ruth Laura Malloy. Let's clap again. I'm personally thrilled to bestow this honor on one of Canada's most important figures in the fight for racial justice and human rights. For more than six decades, Ruth Laura Malloy has dedicated her life to understanding and empathizing with others. As a journalist, she covered critically important stories of racial discrimination, gender disparity, and workplace inequities. Her photojournalism captured images from around the world of regular people living and working, telling their stories from the far reaches of Canada's north to tiny villages in rural China. A travel book author, she opened the world to a new set of adventures, bridging cultural understanding and connection. Born and raised in Brockville, Ontario, her family ran the local Chinese food restaurant. Ruth Laura Malloy has been open about her experiences of prejudice and misogyny growing up in post-war Canada, a reckoning I think we all still have to deal with today. These experiences, however painful, cultivated her passion for social justice. Her focus on universal rights and freedoms took her to Washington, D.C. and the University of Toronto and Dresden, Ontario. It was there she tested the 1954 Fair Accommodations Act, which was intended to prevent discrimination in housing and in public places. Working alongside black civil rights activists Hugh Burnett and Bromley Armstrong, she tested the new law at Kay's Cafe in Dresden. Refused service and threatened by the owner with a meat cleaver, they refused to back down. The exchange became headline news and forced the Canadian government to act on the new law, which is incredible. Thank you for doing that. Whether it's sit-ins, rent-ins, or protests, Ruth Laura Malloy was active in peaceful resistance, strategies that work to highlight inequities in our society. These joint efforts helped to enforce critically important laws prohibiting discrimination in public spaces, housing, and the workplace. She has spent her life learning from others, and she believes strongly in people's humanity and their kindness. She encourages everybody to open themselves up to learning from others. As she puts in her own words, we may not be able to change the world, but we can brighten our own corners. Thank you so much, Ruth Laura Malloy, for brightening ours. So, Madam Chancellor, for her unfaltering commitment to diversity, equity, and human rights for all, it's with great pleasure that I present to you, Chancellor Ruth Lore Malloy, candidate for the degree Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Ruth Lore Malloy, by the authority vested in me by the Senate of York University, I hereby confer on you the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Admito Tead Gradum. Dr. Malloy, congratulations. I will now invite Dr. Ruth Laura Malloy to come to the podium and address convocation.
Good morning, Chancellor Taylor, uh, Vice President Pitt, uh, Dean McMurty, faculty and staff of liberal arts and professional studies, and of course, each of the graduates and your families and friends here today. Congratulations to you all. Uh, COVID-19 has made your journey more challenging than those of previous generations. Your success up to now is to be highly commended. Many of you have taken a stand on the iniquities that permeate society today. It was also racism that drove me to do something many decades ago. I grew up, as you've been told, in the small Ontario town of Brockville in one of two Chinese families. It was during the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act which banned any more Chinese immigrants to Canada. Some people were afraid of us. My mother was born in Canada, but because she was Chinese, she couldn't vote until that act was repealed in 1947. Later, when I was in college in Toronto, I discovered that being shunned and subjected to derogatory name-calling was nothing compared to what some of my classmates had experienced. I met Jewish students had, who had barely escaped the Holocaust, and I dated a Canadian-born man who had been imprisoned as a child in Western Canada because his parents were born in Japan. And then opportunities to learn more and do something about such injustices started appearing in my life. An uncle asked for my help organizing a delegation to Ottawa to petition for a change in an immigration regulation. Although Canadians of Chinese and Asian origin could vote then, we weren't allowed to bring grandparents to join us here. That other Canadians could do so just wasn't fair. Then after we fought for and achieved family reunification, I realized that ordinary people like me could successfully petition our government for such changes. It was exciting, empowering, and encouraging. My dream was to travel right and to take on racial discrimination. After graduation in 1954, I headed to Washington to attend a workshop on nonviolent ways um, to deal with it. Our multiracial group tested soda fountains and playgrounds to make sure anti-discrimination laws were being obeyed. It was the year before Rosa Parks' historic stand in Alabama. Our wonderful Afro-American teacher, Wally Nelson, wondered about efforts to fight racism in Canada. There was no Google then to ask, so back in Toronto, my curiosity led to the Joint Labour Committee on Human Rights. It invited me to take part in its test of a new Ontario law that prohibited the refusal of services because of race or religion in public places like restaurants. I immediately agreed and was pleased to be able to tell Wally that we in Canada were doing something too. Dresden is a small town in southwestern Ontario where two restaurants and a barber shop were refusing to serve black people then. Barmany Armstrong, Hugh Burnett, and I, all people of color, held a sit-in at Kay's Cafe. We asked for service, but didn't get it, while others in our white control group did. Subsequent court cases succeeded in forcing all three businesses to comply with the law. It was a reason to celebrate, especially when our cases became the precursor to the Ontario Human Rights Code. After Dresden, I was eager to explore the world. I worked and saved money for a bus ticket to Mexico. I volunteered to work in an indigenous village on a project organized by the Quakers and the Mexican government. I learned that poverty had a lot to do with racism. Our little group did what the timid, self-effacing Otomi people themselves wanted done. We introduced fig trees into their limited economy and helped them build stone stoves 
to replace the open fires in their huts. When I returned 50 years later, figs were a major crop. The place was thriving. The Otomi were proud of their ethnic identity. I like to think we helped to make a difference. My Mexican experience led to other work camps. In Japan, we attempted to help Hong Kong students overcome the pain left by the Japanese occupation that ended only 15 years before. I watched Japanese and Hong Kong students become close friends during those two weeks of working, learning, and playing together. Watching them work out their differences was very satisfying. My writing career developed on its own with every trip. It started when my hometown newspaper requested stories from Mexico and paid me $5 each. Then there was our work camp in the Canadian Arctic, assisting Inuit survivors of tuberculosis. The Globe and Mail asked for stories about our adventures there, and fortunately paid more. Then I wanted to visit China to learn about my roots. It was still new China then, and its government and people were struggling. After my second trip there in 1973, I started writing guidebooks to help international travelers understand that country and for China to understand its visitors. This is how I came to live my dream of travel and writing. I hope you will be similarly blessed with fulfilling your dreams too, especially if you want to help save our planet. Because of travel and writing, I found a perfect husband, a journalist who was looking for a wife to share his adventures. Another dream come true. I was very fortunate. My husband, Mike, supported all my efforts, even my attempts in Mumbai, India, in 1997 to help a group of eunuchs known there as Hijras. Hijras are mainly Hindu, who were born male, but preferred to be female. Many Indian families rejected their male children when they exhibited feminine behavior. As a result, these young people were forced to join a hijra community to survive. There they lived by begging and prostitution. Although they have a small role, blessing newborn babies, hijras were hated by most Indians. The possibility of a story and a desire to help them drove me to learn more. Fortunately, I found other like-minded people who wanted to be of assistance, too. In our little group of volunteers were Hindus, a Jain, a Parsi, and me. We encouraged one group of hijras to tell us their story, their painful castration, their dreams, and their goddess. They wanted education, jobs, and respect. So we helped them write a booklet about themselves to sell on the streets. It was a very simple thing to do. We organized a launch at the Bombay Press Club. I think the time was ripe for a change. As a result, Indian newspapers and magazines, reaching millions of readers, started publishing positive stories about them. The Times of India's banner headline was, let's give uniques a chance in society. It was a great change. When it was time for Mike and me to leave Mumbai, our hijras wrote me thank you notes. One said, you have come from somewhere and worked so hard for us, which no one else did. Because of you, many people have now come forward to help. I like to think we also influenced government practices. Official Indian documents, such as passport applications, now include a transgender option, as well as male and female. And this happened before it did in Canada. The problems you face today are existential and more critical than those of my era. Holding us back still is indifference and the lack of respect for others who are different from us, other races, other cultures, 
other nations, even other soccer teams. We have to cooperate with others instead of just shouting at them and shooting them. Many of you are already trying to do this, but we need to get more people involved. Decades have passed since my era, my generation made some progress, but we also saddled you with many issues to resolve. You have more skills and knowledge than my generation had, and I hope you will use them wisely. I hope you will not give your innate curiosity and your ability to think and create to artificial intelligence. My book, Brightening My Corner, a memoir of dreams fulfilled, was recently published. Writing it without the help of a bot helped me to evaluate what I did with my life in time to make a change. And I hope you will also look at your lives too from time to time. Have you really been respecting others and trying to alleviate their suffering? I believe that if we take down one stone from the walls of indifference and hatred that separate us, and someone else takes down another stone, someday that wall will be gone. The torch is now yours. Thank you. <laughs>